there. Welcome to the house of God. It's a wonderful place to be on the Lord's Day, first day of the week. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we're thankful for the privilege of looking at your word today. Thank you for Christ's rising. Thank you for the privilege we have of giving out the gospel. We pray that you would bless the saints up in Medford and uh, as they hear <coughs> Brother Stagger preaching the word of God, that uh, they would be encouraged and uh, go forward spiritually. Pray you'd encourage the Suttons uh, at this time of uh, trial, and we know that your love is infinite, and uh, you are full of grace, and that you have given us the comforter to comfort us in difficult times. So we pray that you would comfort them by the Spirit of God in a great way, and give them great grace and strength, and also for uh, with that whole situation. And we pray that you would also bless us now. Thank you for the privilege of being able to hear your word, and help us to put in practice what we're going to be hearing today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I know that, of course, many of you are regularly in Pastor Sutton's class, which is fantastic, and uh, thank you, thank you. We're not going to be sprinkling anybody. We believe in immersion around here, but, but we do have that up here. In case you, uh, if somebody's falls asleep, just, oh, no, that, that'll work too, so I'll get you awake. But... Um, so uh, we're, we're in Bible, in, for the normal people in my class, of course, we're in Bible study number five. Um, not, not the normal people. <laughs> yeah, that, that, people are going to be taking, okay, same as we're more than the normal people, yeah, yeah. Well, if you're in the Bay Area, you know, you're supposed to be all things to all men, and people here just aren't normal, so, so you have to kind of be, be like that. So, but we don't need to just randomly, like, like on, on Market Street, you know, just need to like, like randomly yell out or stuff, we, 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 that's okay, we don't, we don't need any of that. So um, anyway, but um, the people that are normally in the class, uh, you know that we're in study five, going through what repentance is not, and we're going to be looking at that in just a second here. But actually, before we get into that, um, back, in, back in days of yore, uh, when we started, uh, in study number one, I think everybody was in here when we were going through that. It was a different setup at that time. Um, but in study number one, there's this quotation that I have. It says, we're talking about the preservation of Scripture. And it says, furthermore, all but 11 of the 7,957 verses of the New Testament could be reproduced without a single manuscript from the 36,289 quotes made by early writers in Christendom from the 2nd to the 4th century. And that sounds pretty impressive. <coughs> I cited it from the Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics and Norman Geisler, which is generally a, a very good source, very useful. But this particular quote is actually a little bit too specific. So actually, I'm going to be taking it out of study number one because you actually can't prove it to that level of specificity. So I'd encourage you not to use that specific quote and I'm planning to edit it out of study number one. Now, you can say the following, um, let's see. You can say, besides the textual evidence derived from New Testament Greek manuscripts and from early versions, the textual critic has available the numerous scriptural quotations included in the commentaries, sermons, and other treatises by early church uh, writers. Indeed, so extensive are these citations that if all other sources for our knowledge of the text of the New Testament were destroyed, they would be sufficient alone for the reconstruction of practically the entire New Testament. That is still true, but that's not quite as specific as the statement here. So the statement that I have in the study now that I need to take out, it says all but 11 of the 7,957 verses. That's, it's not quite that easy because sometimes it's not as easy to tell the difference between a specific quotation, an allusion, a reference, things like that. Like, like you might be at a door and say, hey, the Bible says you need to be saved. Well, that's true, but that's not a specific quotation. Is So... Um, it's a little bit too specific, and then um, 36, so 36,289 quotes, is that, that may be quotes, allusions, and so, and then the second of the fourth century, uh, maybe a little bit broader than that. So I just wanted to mention that, so this is a widely used quote, this one that I have in blue here, but it's actually not, if you look into the sources of it, it's not quite provable, okay? So I'm going to take it out and because God has got a truth, we want to be honest and, and tell the truth. So this statement that I read here, that's a little bit, little bit less specific, is still true. Okay, there's still great confirmation of Scripture from 
um, the evidence for the Bible is still overwhelming that God preserved it. But this is a better quotation. This is accurate. The other one is a little bit too specific. So just to mention that. And then uh, the main thing is we're in study five. So uh, we're in the section on what repentance is not. And we saw that repentance is not, now I don't know where I put the little clicker thing. So, no clicker. Oh, here's the clicker. Okay, good. Got the clicker. So, we've seen in what repentance is not, we saw that taking out the profession of Christianity is not the same thing as repentance. People can profess to be Christians and not really be Christians. Oh, I believe Titus 1, uh, we saw that uh, a good while ago. There's different examples of that in the Bible of people who profess to be Christians and are not. And we hear that all the time, but remember, we don't, can't assume that if you're doing an evangelistic Bible study with somebody that he thinks that way. He could just assume, well, of course, everyone who claims to be a Christian is a Christian. I mean, everyone who claims to be a Muslim is a Muslim, so why can't everyone who claims to be a Christian be a Christian, right? So uh, Mormons don't have a category of professing Mormons that aren't really Mormons, right? So um, we need to keep that in mind. And then we spent some time on receiving baptism not being repentance. We went through a good number of texts that showed how, uh, what to say to people who think that baptism is the point sins are taken away, because of course that's very common. Many, many, many people in the realm of Christianity think that when a person is baptized, that's the moment his sins are taken away. And so we looked at texts that we can use to, to help people see that that's not the case, for example, 1 Corinthians 1, 14 to 17, where Paul says that he didn't kind of preach, uh, didn't, he did kind of preach the gospel, but not to baptize. Okay, and uh, it was the gospel through which they were saved. 1 Corinthians 4, 15 with that, he was the one through whom they were born again, but he hadn't baptized them. So 1 Corinthians 1, 14 to 17 and 4, 15 is a great one of many passages you can share with people. And we also looked at the text people use to say that baptism is the point of the new birth. Mark 16, 16, John 3, 5, 1 Peter 3, 21. We just wrapped those ones up last time. So, um, you know, you can see how those texts don't actually teach the false teaching that baptism is the point at which sins are taken away. And so, uh, and then in, in the actual Bible study, and you know, obviously, if you're going through this with somebody, if that's a stronghold for him, you want to make sure you have answers. If it's not a stronghold for him, you're like, okay, baptism, being baptized doesn't mean you repent. Oh, okay, okay. Well, then you don't need to spend a lot of time on that, obviously. But if it is a stronghold, then you do spend a lot of time, so, uh, or more time. So Simon the sorcerer was baptized, but he had never repented. And the thief on the cross had never been baptized, but he had repented. So now we have a new thing here. We're in our new section, which is that simply possessing moral righteousness or externally conforming to the rules of piety is not repentance. And so we'll go to Luke 18, Luke chapter 18, verses 11 and 12. Luke 18, 11 and 12. So uh, in other words, simply being a moral person uh, doing religious duties is not the same thing as having genuinely repented. People can be moral, people can have done lots of religious things, and they can not have repented. <clears throat> I should mention that sometimes, uh, especially I would say if people don't want to specifically name a false religion, sometimes they just say things like, you know, well, that's just religion, okay? And, and there's certainly, religion can be used in a broad sense in, in a way that it's bad, but um, the Bible also uses religion in a positive way. Pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this, right? So, so we're for pure religion and undefiled. We're, we're just against you know, false religion. But simply being moral or uh, externally conformed to the rules of piety is not the same thing as repentance. Now, let's look at Luke 18, 11, and 12. Or we'll start in verse, we'll read verse is 9 through 14. Get the context here because a text without a context is a pretext, right? So Luke 18, 9 to 14. And he spake this parable, this is the Lord Jesus speaking, unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. Well, that was a good thing to do, right? The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And what's a publican? 
tax collector. Yeah, publican. Not a Republican, a publican. Okay. Uh, the Pharisee stood, he would be for lower taxes, right? Uh, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Hmm, praying with himself. Well, that's not quite what we're looking for. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Give him a scratch, scratch, scratch and sniff or something. Like You're really great. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. All right, so here we have this Pharisee. This Pharisee. What did... Was the Pharisee a moral person? Assuming that he's telling the truth here. I mean, I guess he could be really committing adultery and, and lying about it, but I don't think he probably was doing that. I think that he really thought what he was saying was true and God was going to be pleased with it, <coughs> even though his prayer bounced off the ceiling. But what kind of person was this guy? Was it? He was boastful. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was definitely boastful. Yes, he was definitely boastful. He was proud. Sure. Would you be afraid of meeting him in a dark alley late at night? No. You might be like, oh, this guy's so full of himself. But, but you wouldn't be, he's not going to attack you, right? Because he's not unjust, right? He's, he's not an extortioner. So he was apparently fair in his dealings with people. He wasn't an adulterer. He fasted twice a week. That's pretty good. I only do that every second week. Uh, but, no, he fasted twice a week. I mean, that's a lot of fasting. And he gave tithes of all that he possessed, even the herbs, right? Matthew 23, even the little herbs, they would count that. The law did say to do that. But, so, he was this moral person. Was he justified? No. No, he wasn't justified. What does justified mean? Declared righteous. Yeah, you have the word just and defied. Declared just, declared righteous. <clears throat> so he was a lost person despite going to the temple to pray and having a lot of morality to him. Okay? So we can see clearly that a person can be unconverted despite having a lot of moral dealings. Okay? Uh, then we have here the next thing. 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22. One may escape the pollutions of the world by knowing truth about Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. The biblical emphasis upon doing, no, not displaying before everybody else what you give, your righteous things and all that, that's not in a lot of other false religions. So, for example, I had a Muslim co-worker one time, and during Ram, and I was like, yeah, I'm fasting, and during the day, you know, whatever, and he's telling everybody how great he was about all this stuff. And I'm thinking about what Jesus said about how you, you do it in secret when you fast, and so, and there's a Catholic also co-worker, it's like, yeah, I fast sometimes too, and they're all just talking about it, and so I was, you know, thinking about what the Bible says about this. Or uh, even in Judaism. So the Pharisee, Phariseeism is basically modern, cons modern Orthodox Judaism is Phariseeism, basically. Okay? Um, but um, they will put the names of the donor, like all these things to kind of display the person. So then when this Pharisee was kind of exalting himself, that's not that uncommon for the religions of the world. Okay, 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end with them, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, Proverbs 26, 11. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, 
and the sow, the pig, that was washed to her wallowing in the mire, in the dirt and mud. All right, so here are the people in this passage truly saved people? No. Okay. How do we know that? What in this passage shows that these are not genuinely saved people? Sure. So they are, they are returned to them, and they're overcome. So they go back to their old lifestyle, their old ungodly lifestyle, and it overcomes them. They just go back, and they are, they are overcome. Well, that shows that these are people who were saved and lost salvation. They were saved. They became God's sheep. And then they turned back into being pigs again and turned back into being uh, uh, dogs, right? No? Okay, well, why not? How do we know these weren't people who lost salvation? Okay, so it says they had knowledge. So that's good. So we'll think about that in a second. So it says these people had knowledge. Now, so they knew things. And now, they had knowledge. Did the knowledge even affect their lives in a certain way for a time? It did. Yeah. So they had knowledge. And what did the knowledge lead them to do? Escape from what? Escape pollutions of the world. Wow. Well, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <clears throat> you can think of maybe, maybe, think of a kid at Bethel Christian Academy who avoids, he do, doesn't end up thinking that he's really a woman when he's a man, okay? He doesn't end up getting into drugs. He doesn't end up having 25 billion piercings all over his face, okay? And he escapes from all this foolishness in the state and doctor, I mean, uh, the, uh, the public school, uh, not, I guess, because they, they don't indoctrinate people there, right? Well, actually, I guess you don't learn anything, so, but they, they do indoctrinate, but anyway, so they, they escape all that, right? But that, and, and they avoid a lot of that stuff. <clears throat> and there's people who send their kids to BCA because they, don't, they want their kids not to be in the pollutions of the world. But maybe they don't want them to really be saved, right? If they get saved, oh, that's, uh, I don't want you to go that far. Just escape the pollutions of the world, okay? But that could certainly happen, can it? Okay? And, and then when, uh, when there's not that constraint from the godly teachers, the, the principal, the, the, the godly influence, when they get out on their own, they go right back, okay? Because it wasn't on the inside. But we can see that these people had, so these people had knowledge. They escaped the pollution to the world. So why would we, so, so obviously they must have been sheep, and then they lost salvation, and they turned back into dogs and pigs, right? So what in this passage shows that they were always dogs and pigs, and not they change into sheep, and then boom, phew, they change back again. Yes? Yeah, so they weren't saved in the first place. And if you see in verse 22, notice it doesn't say they were dogs who turned into God's sheep, and then they changed back into dogs. Or it doesn't say they were pigs who turned into sheep, and then changed back into pigs. They were always dogs and pigs, according to verse 22. They were just dogs that were cleaned up. You had little schnookums, and they put a bow tie on them or whatever, okay? They were pigs, and they, you, you, you washed the pig off with a hose, made the pig all nice and clean, okay, while it's squealing, right? Um, you know, are, are you going to turn me into bacon soon here? So, so the pig is all washed off, and then when it can get away, where does it go? Back to the dirt, right? Rooting around in there. So <clears throat> we can see from verse 22, these are people who are outwardly washed. They're just outwardly changed, but they're still the same on the inside. All right? So they weren't people who were saved and lost it, clearly, according to verse 22. But they were people who, through knowing things about Christ, not only had knowledge, but even escaped the pollutions of the world. Is it good to know things about Christ and escape the pollutions of the world? Sure it is. Yeah. Very good. But that doesn't mean they were necessarily born again. And we can see these people weren't, weren't born again. So uh, you can escape the pollutions of the world by knowing truth about Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean a person's genuinely repented. Now, if someone says that he has genuine knowledge of Christ, then he doesn't escape the pollutions of the world. Well, that's, that's not, you know, not, not the real thing either, right? 
Okay, so that's 2 Peter 22. Have a form of godliness, 2 Timothy 3, 5. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. This is verse 5, but let's read verses 1 through 5, because, as I've said before, text without a context is a pretext. <coughs> if you're doing one of these studies with someone, you don't have to, of course, go through every single one of these passages like we're doing now and talk about it in context. You can just mention these things. And Now, if you think this is an issue for the person, like if the person is a type of person who has a form of godliness, or if the person is somebody like the Pharisee in Luke 18, well, then you can camp out on that a little longer, okay? But if this is someone who is not this type of person, well, then obviously you don't need to, we're, you're not teaching it to the lost person so that he can teach it himself at this point. You're teaching it so that he can be saved, okay? But we're going through carefully so that we know how to deal with everyone uh, by the grace of God as much as possible. All right, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. All right, so 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 4. Does that sound like a good Good to be like that or, or, or not so good? To be like 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 4. Not so good, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not very good. Verse 5, having a form of godliness. So having is, you know, an I-N-G word. It's a participle. So people can be, verses 1 through 4, while having a form of godliness. So you can be a person who inwardly is full of covetousness and, you know, is proud and is unthankful and you can still have a form of godliness. Well, what is this form? Okay, The form is the outward appearance, the shape, the form of godliness. So you can put on the right clothes, you know how to act in church, and it's good to put on the right clothes, and it's good to know how you have to act in church. But you deny the transforming, but they're denying the transforming power of the new birth and the gospel. See, they are denying the power thereof. They were not renewed inwardly. They were only changed somewhat on the outside. And uh, that, yes? Hypocrisy? Christian by name only. Christian by name only, yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> C-I-N-O, Christian in name only, yeah. Having a form of godliness, yeah. And I've, I've had people that I've worked with that are kind of like that too. When they find out you're a Christian, they can put on the talk. Oh, they have the talk. In the South, where everyone's a Christian, right? Um, they, they know how to put on this talk. But does that mean they're real? No, nope, doesn't mean that. So you can have a form of godliness. Now, notice godliness does have a form. There is an outward characteristic that is appropriate to godliness. So you say, well, you can have a form of godliness, so therefore I'm not going to have any form of godliness. I'm going to look just like the most worldly, fleshly person because I don't want to have a form of godliness. Well, you don't want to just have a form of godliness, but godliness does have an outward form. So there is actually an outward appearance that God, that is appropriate to godliness, but that's not enough. They just have the outward appearance. Okay? So here people do have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. So don't, now if it's one or the other, have the real thing and, and, and you know, work on the form later, but you, you actually want both the most important, the inward thing, and have the form too. God wants both those things. So, uh, how, so you can, people can have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And uh, here he says, separate from them, from such turn away. Okay, turn away from people like that. Which would be a basis for churches practicing ecclesiastical separation from those that are worldly, that, that just have the form. All right. Uh, next thing it says, uh, they can pray long, Matthew 23, 14. People can pray a long time and never have repented. 
So go to Matthew 23 and verse 14. Matthew 23 and verse 14. We just heard some good preaching through Matthew 23 not very long ago. Matthew 23 and verse 14. The eight woes that correspond to the eight blessings in Matthew 5, 3 to 12. So Matthew 23, 14. The Lord says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. So that doesn't sound very good. We're against devouring widows' houses. We're against being a hypocrite. And we know greater damnation definitely doesn't sound very good. But notice that they do make long prayer. They pray a long time. Is that good? Yeah, it is good to pray a long time. But so here people clearly can pray a long time and not have genuinely repented. Now, is genuine prayer, genuine calling on the Lord, is that characteristic of a true believer? Yes, it is. Like, for example, um, Job 27.10 says that those who genuinely delight in the Almighty will always call upon God. I mean, if God is your father, wouldn't you want to talk to him? <laughs> yeah, of course you would. Okay? If you have a good relationship with a fellow human, a fellow person, you want to communicate with that person. You want to talk, you want to be together, and, and, and things like that. So uh, if you have a genuine relationship with your Heavenly Father, you're going to want to want to talk. Okay, you're going to, going to want to pray. You're going to want to call upon him. Okay, it's the right thing. Um, so, but simply spending a certain amount of time in prayer doesn't mean a person is genuinely repented. You know where the wailing wall is in Israel? See those guys, they stand at the wall and do their thing. They might be there a long time. Are they getting through? Nope, <laughs> they're not getting anywhere. When, when uh, Heather and I went to Israel, uh, we were on the plane, and there were all these Jews on there, you know, of course, and some of them were Orthodox. So every so often on the plane, they would get up, and they, would, they, they, they do this thing with their body, because they want to show that even with their body, they're honoring God. So they move their body when they pray. That's why they do this, to show that even with their body, they're trying to honor God. And it's good to honor God made our bodies, so it's good to honor God with their bodies. But they get up, and they would like repeat their prayer and do that stuff, and some of them would do it for a long time, but uh, didn't get anywhere, didn't, didn't, unfortunately. Uh, through, wasn't through Christ. They weren't born again without Jesus as your mediator. Sorry, uh, your, your prayer is rejected. So um, genuine prayer is a characteristic of a true believer, but someone can spend a lot of time in prayer and not have genuinely repented. Think about nuns or priests in um, in monasteries, you know, the five of them that are sincere in there. Um, the, but they might spend a lot of time in prayer, okay? And it's not getting through because Mary is not, <laughs> doesn't want to hear you. So uh, we can see that people can pray a long time, and that doesn't mean they've genuinely repented. And, and now that doesn't mean that somebody who never prays, well, okay, pray a long time, they could be fake, well, I'm not even going to pray at all. Well, no, that's not, that we're not saying that, okay? But we're saying that you can pray a long time and not have genuinely repented, okay? Then it says, fast often. Pray long, fast often. We already saw that with the, um, the, the Pharisee. He fasted twice a week. <clears throat> he, well, let's go, go back and look at that again. So Luke 18, uh, 18, 12. So he was fasting often. He says, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Okay. Now, that's a lot of fasting, especially in an indulgent culture. There's an early book, we don't know who wrote it, uh, but probably a first century document for somebody that is at least, I, you know, was a true believer or not, I have no idea. But there's an early Christian writing called the Didache, which means like the teaching. And in there, it actually is talks about fasting twice a week. Just do it on different days than the days the Jews do it. <laughs> so at least some of the early people in Christianity did fa continue to fast twice a week. So that's a lot of fasting. But it is, the Bible never says, you know, you have to fast a certain amount of time. But Jesus does say, you know, when you fast, not if you fast. So I think we should do it. 
uh, it's the right thing. Unless you have you know, a health problem that keeps you from being able to do it, then God doesn't want you to destroy your life, your, your body. But it is the right thing to fast. But in any case, we can see this person's fasting often, and fasting isn't fun. I mean, you get hungry, right? You, you want to eat, and you're weak. You know, who wants to be like that? But that doesn't mean that this person was genuinely born again because he fasted twice a week. Um, that this Pharisee wasn't, he was a patriotic Jew. He wasn't a sellout to the Roman government like the tax collector. This guy's helping the Romans. I'm not helping the Romans. So he, um, he was a, a uh, had a lot of outward things, but that doesn't mean he had the real thing. All right. Uh, then it says, hear the word gladly, Mark 6 and verse 20. Mark 6, 20. How many lost people love to hear the word of God purely and convictingly and strongly preached? Not many, right? If they did, this place would be like, we'd have thousands and thousands. Like, everybody like, wow, you're, you're preaching through the Bible verse by verse and applying it carefully? Ooh, we want that. Oh, man. We, let, let's pack this. Pl- for, forget that rock concert. Let's come here. This is where we want to be. We want to hear the word of God. Well, um, not very many people are like that, right? So obviously, anybody who likes to hear the Bible must be saved, right? Well, let's look at this. This, this is amazing. Mark 6 and verse 20. Mark six twenty. Who are we talking about here? This is King Herod. Was King Herod a godly person? Uh, no, not exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let, let's look at the context here. So let's start in verse 17. For Mark 6, 17. For Herod himself, and, and before this, so Herod in verse 16, he, he's talking about a time he'd beheaded John the Baptist and his conscience was tormenting him for having done it. Uh, verse 17. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. So he was committing this unlawful uh, relationship. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Notice John was respectful to Herod. He didn't say you, whatever. He was respectful, but he told him the truth. And Herod didn't like that. Um, So he was, therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and an holy and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. And then on his birthday, he had his head chopped off, verses 21 and following. Hmm. Okay, so did King Herod lightly, what did Herod do later to somebody even greater than John the Baptist? What did he do to Jesus? It's part of his trials that led his crucifixion, right? Okay. So, not a righteous person. Did Herod just, oh, this John the Baptist guy, I don't care about him. Was that his attitude toward John the Baptist? No. What did Herod do with John the Baptist? What was his attitude towards John the Baptist in verse 20? He was attentive. Yeah, it says he heard him, so he, he would hear John the Baptist. He, he would go and hear John the Baptist preach. Do you think, when you see what John the Baptist is preaching in Matthew 3, you know, you, you know you, snakes and vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. You know, and, and think not to say within yourselves, you have Abraham to our father. God is able to make these trees children unto Abraham. Or, or the stones, okay? So, so John was a strong preacher. John wasn't holding back. John was strongly preaching, warning about hell and judgment and the Messiah coming. You need to believe in the Messiah. He's the Lamb of God. He's going to take away the sins of the world. So that's the kind of preaching that Herod would come here. Wow! Did Herod respect John? Yeah, he feared him. He he knew John wasn't a fake. Herod wasn't, all these preachers, they're all just out there for money. He knew John the Baptist was the real thing. He wasn't a fake. 
He feared him. He respected him. He knew he was just. He knew he was holy. He didn't seem to think that about himself. <laughs> he, I, I think he knew that he wasn't just, that he wasn't holy, but John was. And he respected that, that he was just and holy. And he observed him, it says, so he paid close attention. That also could have the idea of that he protected him, because uh, here Herodias wanted to have him killed, and Herod was against that until he got snookered into doing it. He wouldn't do it. He would not have John the Baptist killed. He protected him. So he liked to hear John the Baptist preach, this strong Baptist preacher, first Baptist preacher, John, he liked to hear him preach. And did he change how he acted based on what he heard? It's right there in the passage. Did he? He did many things. He not only liked to hear John, you snakes and vipers, who hath warned, he liked to hear him preach, and he even responded to the preaching in certain ways. He did not a few things. He did many things. Whoa! He did many things as a result of hearing John the Baptist preach, and he heard him gladly. He was glad to hear him. <coughs> Amazing. So this is uh, Herod's attitude. And then he chopped his head off. <laughs> oh, my, 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 my. So uh, we can see that an unconverted person can like to hear true preaching, can even respond to true preaching in certain ways, do many things, and hear it gladly. Now, of course, a, a child of God who's walking with the Lord, you expect that person to love to hear true preaching, okay? So these are all, these are good things. You, you should do many things when you hear preaching, okay? You should hear it gladly, okay? Uh, that's all right, but that doesn't mean a person's genuinely converted, because here, King Herod did that, and that wasn't uh, the same thing as repentance. All right, so that's amazing. That one is amazing to me, that he, King Herod heard the word gladly. Now let's look at Isaiah 1 and verse 11. Isaiah 111. <clears throat> Herod liked jaw, hard, convicting, strong preaching. Herod had a reverent attitude toward the preaching. Many, now, an unconverted person who doesn't have a reverent attitude toward preaching and doesn't like to hear it, that's really bad. May God help us not to be like that. Okay, Isaiah 1 and verse 11. So here we're going to see that a person can be zealous for the service and worship of God, though costly and expensive. Hmm, okay, so let's look at a little bit of context here. Isaiah 10, uh, Isaiah 10, Isaiah 1, 10 through 15. Isaiah 1, 10 through 15. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. What were they supposed to do? In verse 16, they were supposed to wash, wash you and make you clean, put away the evil of your doings. So, you know, repent, verse 16. So here we can see that these people were zealous for the service and worship of God, though it was costly and expensive. Now, 
In verses 10 through 15, in verse 10 it says, he calls, Isaiah calls his audience, ye rulers of Sodom and ye people of Gomorrah. What was, where, where, was, was, where, where was Sodom and Gomorrah? What happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, there was the Sodomites, okay? No, what, what people, San Francisco, the Castro district, okay? Sodom and Gomorrah, they were, they were committing the, the abomination of homosexuality, okay? All kinds of perversion, wickedness, okay? What was Isaiah, did Isaiah, when Isaiah preached this message, did he have like, a, was he preaching on Zoom? Because Sodom and Gomorrah were like, was he actually like talking to people in the city of Sodom? Had he rebuilt it? No, who was he talking to? Israel, yeah, people in Israel, okay? And so, whoa, the people, the, the people of God, and he calls them people of Sodom and Gomorrah? Oh, my. So he's talking to people of God. He calls them Sodom and Gomorrah, okay? In verses 11 through 15, were these people worshiping false gods? Now, and elsewhere in Isaiah, people are worshiping false gods. But right here, is he warning about worshiping false gods? No. They're worshiping Jehovah. Had God in the Pentateuch established burnt offerings of rams and the blood of bullocks and lambs and he goats? He had. They were worshiping God the way he told them to. God had told them to do it, and they were doing what he said. Well, that sounds good, right? If you sacrifice a bull, is that costing you a lot of money? Yeah, they're expensive. Tastes great, right? Oh, but they're uh, the lambs and, and things like that, right? Uh, lamb chops. But, but these are expensive things. You know, lambs don't grow on trees. <laughs> it takes a while to, to, to they get they're born and they get big and it t this is expensive worship. They're sacrificing a lot to, to offer incense, which maybe they had to bring it from wherever, uh, long distance. The new moons appointed. You can even say appointed feasts. God had appointed these feasts. Solemn meetings. These weren't charismatics going blah 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 blah, blah with all kinds of crazy stuff. They had a solemn meeting. Great, solemn meeting, you no know, appointed feasts, but God said he couldn't stand it. Why? Well, because they hadn't repented. Their hands are full of blood. All right? So did God appoint them all to do sacrifices? Yes. Did God appoint the new moon festival? Yes. Did God appoint the appointed feasts? Yes. Did God appoint the solemn meeting? Yes. Did a multitude of sacrifices cost a lot of money? Yes. Is it good to make many prayers like these people did in verse 15? Yes, it is good to make many prayers. So here are people who care enough about the instituted worship of the true God, not about false worship of false gods, or even false worship of the true God, but true instituted worship in everything external uh, to, of the true God. But God rejects it as iniquity. Why? Because they weren't clean, verses 15 and 16. So we can see that people can be happy about true worship and sacrifice a great deal to practice it, and still be unconverted, never having repented. So the repentant man is a moral person, as the Christian man is a human being. But um, you can, one can be moral and not be repentant, as one can be human but not be Christian. So if you're, if you're a Christian, you're going to be moral, but you can be moral and not be Christian. If you are moral and pious but not converted, you will certainly be damned. And if you are not even moral and pious, how terrible will be your coming condemnation. So the point here is that many outward ch changes can take place in someone's life while he's still lost. Someone who does not have outward changes is also still lost because he has not been changed inwardly. Inward change will result in outward change. And we're going to see that when we see what repentance positively is. But people can have lots of outward changes and not be repentant. That's, just, that's the, we're at the end of that section. We're not going to get any further than that today. But by way of application, uh, we've been making application the whole time. Obviously, uh, there is application to lost people. If you are somebody who just has the outside but doesn't have it on the inside, well, you need to repent and believe the gospel. Don't be like these people. Don't be like King Herod. King Herod is in hell. Don't be like the people in Isaiah 1. Don't be like the Pharisee who didn't, wasn't justified even though he went to the temple to pray. 
you know, people can come into the temple, the New Testament temple, the church even, and be like these people. Don't be like that. That's certainly an application. Uh, I would also say <coughs> application to believers. <coughs> Let's make sure that we are doing what we're doing out of a heart for God. We need to make sure that we are not just settling down into formalities, that we're just here because we know it's the right thing, and we know that the Bible teaches, you know, singing psalms and hymns, and we know the Bible teaches you should, you should, you know, come to church and take notes and be in all the services. We know these things are taught, so we do them, but we don't have that inward heart attitude. Well, we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we, uh, God's, God is a spirit, and we, we need to make sure we're worshiping in spirit and truth. So he doesn't just want these outward things. He wants that inward spirit and what a privilege we have to, to, to that God cares about us worshiping him and he actually wants to hear from us through Jesus Christ by the spirit. Amazing. What a privilege. Let's make sure that we are offering him those things, not just the outward, but also the inward because God made a whole universe. He doesn't need whatever we can offer him anyway. Okay, we get to, just like if you're a parent and your, your kid brings you like a crayon thing that like, it's not going to be in the, the art museum, okay? But you think it's really great. Why? Because he's your kid, right? You know? So, uh, but um, he doesn't need what we offer him, but we still have the privilege of doing it. But let's make sure that we are offering it out of that inward heart and not be like these people as an application to us. And, you know, obviously if you have the privilege of being in Pastor Sager's class most of the time, these other sessions are we, we post them so you actually can still see it and you can learn. You can get two things. You can learn how to do an evangelistic Bible study and you also learn how to deal with emotional pain and all those things in there. That's great. You know, even more. So, all right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, we're thankful for your word. Thank you for its clear teaching. We thank you that you are a God who does not just want uh, what's on the outside. You do not just want a, merely a form of godliness without the power thereof. We pray that you would help us to be skilled in sharing with uh, lost people these truths, and we pray that you would um, also help us to make, examine our own hearts to make sure that we, in our worship of you, are not like um, these people who just have good stuff on the outside, but their hearts are far away from you. We don't want that to be us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.